Is that okay now? Uh, I don't see sharing yet. Thank you. For oh, the sharing is coming now. Wait a second. So, I give. Is that visible? Uh, still coming. Uh -huh. Do you, other people, do you see it? I do not see it. Okay, I see it. The full screen. Yeah, go ahead, please. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, thank you. Uh, and the subject of tonight, today, this afternoon, is the CBM experiment. And actually, this is the current situation at uh, FAIR in Germany, close to Darmstadt. Uh, and what you can see there is actually the pic a picture, a drone picture of the this 100 machine, where the um, yeah, the construction uh, is actually finished. You don't see anything anymore except uh, kind of a ring. Uh, and be, uh, below this is where the uh, tunnel of the this 100 is located. It is, it is all located close to the old GSI, where one can see here the ring of the this 18 uh, synchrotron. And this building is from the Unilac. So the, this is a injector chain uh, that one can see here. And the beam is then transferred through this line into this uh, new machine here. And from there, it is extracted into this uh, kind of construction here, uh, which is actually the home of CBM. So this piece here is uh, kind of supposed to uh, house the CBM experiment. And you can see already that all of the infrastructure is almost there. There's buildings for cryo. This is a superconducting uh, synchrotron and uh, there's a power building. And then there's still lots of construction going on on the south side here for one of the major uh, experiments, uh, which is kind of the rare isotope facility with a super fragment separator. So what I will try to focus on is to tell you what will be happening in um, in this building here. And of course, I could also have uh, chosen a completely different uh, title for the talk. And namely, this is, wait a second, why does it move it? Maybe I have to do this here. Namely, how does one study or in the in the future dense baryonic matter? And this has received lately quite some attention because as everybody knows, uh, I guess uh, there was this observation of the uh, neutron star mergers, this GW070817, uh, where the, the interest in uh, dense baryonic matter was uh, really uh, amplified a lot. But what we will try or what we are trying to do, and we are trying to do this since quite a while, is to study uh, kind of the properties of this dense baryonic matter in heavy ion collisions. And there are quite some differences. However, uh, maybe the, the uh, common thing is that density is up to yeah, a couple of uh, O0, so the normal nuclear matter density is being reached, although with uh, different time scales, but still in this uh, merger case, with in some regions similar uh, temperatures. And this is much closer to uh, the original, which is still a, a nice goal, namely to understand the interior of colder neutron stars, uh, which uh, is however a little bit further away because I mean the uh, connection between astrophysics and also heavy ion physics is not so simple. There's an isospin degree of freedom there. There is um, the uh, temperature. And all of this, of course, needs to be considered when uh, now trying to kind of connect these two fields. I think the uh, fundamental questions are nevertheless, on the nuclear physics side, important enough that even without the neutron stars, it would be worthwhile uh, pursuing these in investigations because uh, at those densities, when the, nucle the, nu uh, yeah, the nucleons 
kind of uh, get so close to each other that they lose their, ident their identity, it is still not understood uh, what kind of phases uh, are developing there and actually whether there is a phase structure that can be observed. Uh, so it's something like a first order phase transition or not. However, what should clearly be happening is uh, that chiral symmetry should be restored at these large uh, densities. And also this needs to be proven experimentally. And in the moment, uh, this is all theory. And I think it would be great if we would at some point be able to confirm or to you know, also uh, yeah, uh, kind of quantify uh, how this really happens at the various uh, under various conditions. And then, of course, QCD allows for uh, also many more states than is currently observed. And this is another chance where I think we can extend the knowledge about uh, QCD behavior. Charm is yet another issue that uh, needs attention. So what I will do now, I, I think this is the outline of the talk, uh, if I manage, <laughs> let's see. Uh, tell you a little bit of uh, the phase structure in general, uh, hopefully without too much theory, but uh, nevertheless, the way I, I see it. Then I will tell you the key features of, of CBM and walk you through the main observables uh, that are uh, kind of being addressed by this experiment. Uh, in the end, uh, or in the second part, I try to tell you how far we have advanced in preparing uh, this uh, experiment with something that we call mini CBM, MCBM. And then in the very end, I will also tell you a little bit about the overall status also with FAIR. And you certainly have heard all the um, talk about um, cost overrun and uh, the FAIR status in general. And I will try to bring you up to date on what the current situation is. Okay, uh, I hope I'm still, yes, I am still connected. I see the picture from the room. So yes, so uh, how does one address all these things? And I, I think there one doesn't have to make uh, too much of a, a secret out of it. I, I think this was all exercised and demonstrated uh, with a star experiment at uh, Brookhaven, namely in order to address the phase structure of uh, the um, of the phase diagram, of the QCD phase diagram, it's very clear one has to vary energies. And this is running now since quite a while at, uh, at Brookhaven. And actually this run starts in a couple of days from now. And, uh, I just saw I was connected to the control room because we operate there a device uh, that is uh, part of CBM already, namely ETOF which is the end cap time of light in star. You can see it here in this uh, kind of picture there, which we operate since 20, well, what was it? 18, I think. Uh, and uh, this is uh, kind of also already connected to the future program because the energies that were covered by the fixed target program of star is pretty much uh, at the lower end at the, or the higher barrier uh, density. Uh, chemical potentials, baryon chemical potentials, is pretty much uh, what we are aiming at uh, to measure with CBM uh, now at FAIR. And uh, since uh, uh, data taking was completed already uh, two years ago, we have 23 right now, eh? 2021, uh, not all the results are out. But many uh, results are available from BES-1 and BES-2 already. And this, of course, this gives a guideline on what needs to be done in the future. And uh, maybe the more uh, summarizing guideline is given here in terms of uh, the yeah, an updated phase, phase diagram that was prepared also with the help of some colleagues here in Heidelberg, namely Jan Pavlovsky and co-workers where in this typical representation of temperature against uh, baryon chemical potential, one sees uh, how the, the star data points, which are these uh, kind of uh, squares here, are very nicely fitted over the densities by a new approach uh, in theory, namely this uh, functional randomization group technique, 
that allows actually to overcome the limitation of uh, lattice QCD that is limited due to the sign problem here at uh, mu b equals zero. Uh, but the, this whole uh, freeze out data points that are obtained by fitting kind of uh, particle ratios uh, to two uh, parameters, namely the temperature and the baryon chemical potential, that this is very nicely uh, described by these uh, theories, which are able to evolve the bare interaction to higher baryon densities. And that's very interesting because these guys now are also <coughs> able to look for the location of the chiral crossover point and to check whether actually there's any indication for a, uh, a phase transition. And what they claim now uh, is that up to mu b over t equals four, there is no sign of a uh, phase transition at all. Uh, and beyond that, as I was told by Jan, is uh, errors is kind of not so well controlled anymore, uh, but they agree that somewhere <coughs> here in this range, uh, there might be an indication of uh, the divergence of some susceptibilities. And that means there is some indication that a critical endpoint is lying in this range above something like 500 MeV in baryon chemical potential. And if one translates this into, uh, yeah, into an incident energy, square root uh, S or lab energy, actually this is tried, what I tried to do here with systematics that is kind of done by global fits uh, in this framework of the statistical heterogenization model, then one ends up at square root S's that are in the order of three to four, maybe up to five. And if you translate this in lab energies, we are sitting at uh, kinetic uh, beam energies in the order of six to 15 uh, GeV per nucleon. And this of course is now a very nice uh, motivation to actually uh, look to what can be done at this uh, machine in, uh, da in Darmstadt at FAIR, uh, where I here have depicted uh, kind of the overall scheme that is being planned for since about uh, yeah, 18 years, uh, when FAIR actually was inaugurated. And uh, so FAIR is an extension actually of the GSI which is on the left side here with this bluish uh, stuff and is uh, twice as big uh, and contains essentially the driving machine, the ZIS-100, which brings uh, up the energy up to square root S of 4.9 GeV per nucleon. And of course, that is exactly the range that I was just talking about. And now one can ask, what is the, the difference to what has been done before? And the difference here is really the intensity. So this machine allows uh, intensities that are certainly an order of magnitude beyond uh, what was or what is able to what one is able to do at the AGS, uh, and uh, it also offers uh, um, for energies for lighter ions with uh, z equals n, so charge equals neutron number, uh, proton equals neutron number also a little bit higher, so it fully then maybe with some lighter ions up to nickel also addresses maybe the corners of these uh, predictions. I should have said that uh, I think there is some agreement, if one goes back to this here, uh, that there certainly the critical endpoint can be excluded below uh, this U mu b over t equals three. The four, I think that is where what I said, the errors are kind of bringing in more uncertainties. But clearly also what one sees is that the freeze out points, so these fits to the uh, particle abundances, they have some of kind of a very strange kink in this region here. And I, all of this ex from the experimental side, just by looking just sheer, purely to data, uh, makes it interesting to explore this in, in much more detail as what has been done before. And that means with high statistics that allows you to reach uh, yeah, also better accuracy. Now this machine has, of course, uh, also problems and that is cost. And in the moment, the uh, situation looks like such that uh, 
this was stripped down uh, and already two years ago to something which is called the intermediate objective. Uh, and this is this greenish part here. Uh, so it cuts off essentially the antiprotons. And as we will see, this was not enough of a, uh, uh, of a cut down or, and I will discuss that in the very end. But right now, the plan is to start operation of the facility in 2028, uh, which is uh, in just five years from now. And uh, I will show you how far we are, namely that is this picture here. This is a CBM uh, cave uh, in the close up. And what you see is that the, the hall essentially is finished. Uh, this was by the end of this year. And on the right side here, you see how it actually looks from the inside. So it is already uh, fully furbished. And this week, actually, there was this upstream platform that is visible here, uh, started to be installed. And uh, in that sense, I think all the facility is ready now to get equipped with our experiment. And also the accelerator is well on its way. So 2028 right now still seems to be a realistic uh, target date. However, uh, before I am now sounding too optimistic, uh, of course, CBM, and this is actually the CBM uh, experiments that are supposed to be installed now in this hall. And what I had shown you was a view from that side here downstream. Um, so CBM is a fixed target experiment uh, with uh, yeah, a forward uh, spectrometer. It is uh, in its main uh, parts uh, depending on a superconducting uh, dipole magnet, which is of course used for momentum analysis of all the uh, charged particle tracks, uh, which sits uh, and the tracker sits just inside uh, and the target as well. And then followed by a downstream part, which is kind of designed in a modular fashion. Namely, there is a, what something that we call uh, an electron hadron setup where downstream of the tracker you have a rich detector, a transition radiation detector, and a time of flight wall, uh, which allows uh, particle identification for all the, the hadrons and the electrons. And then there's an additional device, which is here still labeled PSD, which will be replaced by an FSD, a forward spec uh, spectator detector. Uh, to allow for centrality and uh, reaction plane determination. So this PID system can be exchanged with what we call MUCH, which is a muon uh, chamber system. So for it, instead of uh, identifying electrons, this is an active absorber uh, setup that allows to identify muons. So that gives us a chance to measure uh, the um, virtual photons, not only in the dielectron channel, but also in the dimuon channel. Now, this was the original idea and it is pursued since quite a while. However, we also have to face the fact uh, that since uh, February last year, we lost this reddish orange uh, kind of uh, components due to the uh, Russian war in Ukraine. And this is still where we have to recover from. However, I think it's in a, on a good way, and I think 2028 <coughs> is manageable from the side of CBM. Now, what is shown in the vision that there is space for in this upstream platform that I mentioned to also house the hardest experiment, but currently uh, which, what is planned is to first occupy this uh, facility with the CBM components, and then only later, whenever the beam comes to some stable performance, uh, we will uh, there is a chance to also move hardest into this new location. So I, I think what is shown, we call uh, the day one configuration, which is, uh, since it includes the MVD, which is our micro vertex detector, um, the, yeah, includes that device, which is still fairly slow. Uh, this is a experimental scenario that uh, should be able, or is a capable of running at 100 kilohertz uh, gold on gold reactions. And why is this important? This is actually kind of one of the selling points of CBM, namely that we are designing 
uh, this experiment for reaching really the ultimate rates that one can uh, dream of in heavy iron collisions. I think uh, we want to, uh, the, all the devices and all the connectivity in the front end is designed such uh, that we can operate it at up to 10 to the seven heavy iron interactions, so gold on gold or lead on lead. Or, we plan for gold on gold, I think, at, uh, at FAIR. Uh, and not uh, like CERN at uh, the, the lead ions. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, 10 to the seven interactions per second fully analyzed is uh, quite a bit more than what is currently uh, be uh, available anywhere in, in the world. And of course that is where, that, which gives us uh, the, uh, the opportunity to really go for systematic uh, kind of investigations of this QCD matter. And there's quite a few things which I will discuss now uh, where uh, statistics uh, in the end will help. Uh, because many of the questions that we have so far uh, are just not statistically significantly enough uh, yeah, addressed. On the other hand, I should also say, and since I started with discussing uh, 10 to the 5 interactions per second, which sits in the ballpark here, still beyond uh, uh, what is reached anywhere else. Uh, so one doesn't always need to uh, push the intensities uh, to the uh, absolute maximum. Uh, and I will tell you that, especially in this dielectron ch dielectron channel, it is much more beneficial to run at these lower energies and then have uh, some background um, rejection capability that this program to push machines and the um, the devices to this high intensities of course is not uh, only by CBM there's also ideas to uh, instrument uh, J Park or to uh, kind of upgrade J Park with a heavy iron facility in a similar uh, intensity region also higher or CEE in China. Uh, is hoping for increasing this and what happens at uh, at Jinnah and in uh, in the Russia I, I'm not really uh, able to say right now uh, but of course uh, it was realized that in this field uh, the intensity is the key uh, quantity I, I think the energy where one needs that one needs to reach this baryon dense matter is pretty much uh, constrained, it's, it's lower energies before one reaches kind of this more transparent uh, regime at the colliders. And yeah, what we are lacking right now is uh, yeah, the next generation experiment. Actually, here's also what uh, we have been doing at uh, STAR. Uh, so if one compare this, there are several orders of magnitude where one can hope for uh, improving the statistical significance. And uh, in order to maybe motivate a little bit that these lower energies are still up for some clarifications and surprises, I hear uh, not again just uh, uh, the experimental data points from these statistical hadronization model fits, uh, which work very well for all these energies. And one can see again this kind of step here in the order of five. 150 MeV where things uh, kind of change and uh, but what is also plotted here and this is from all uh, from some of all old, uh, older FUPI uh, results is uh, that kind of the description uh, with the statistical hadronization model is not only valid for the heavy systems where one would hope that one really gets into the uh, properties of matter but it also already uh, one is very close uh, with light systems, and that, of course, raises the problem, the question whether actually what one is fitting there is really bulk uh, hadronic matter features, or whether there isn't also some sizable effect from uh, non-equilibrium uh, yeah, features in there, which one would have to subtract out. And this is one of the strengths of the machine, actually, that we will have, namely that we are able to also pick other lighter ions in order to study the systematics of this and disentangle bulk effects from maybe uh, non-equilibrium uh, small system size 
and small uh, uh, lifetime effects. And uh, the, uh, the reach that one has is also depicted here. The bluish points is the, this 100 range. And one can see that uh, there's very little known, especially for uh, heavier uh, hyperons on what the, how the production goes. And the interesting thing is that all of this happens close to their individual production thresholds in nuclear nucleon collisions. So I think what we are uh, facing with is physics near those new strangeness opening or antiparticle opening channels there. And in that sense, by looking to those things in more detail, I think one can learn quite a bit about the properties of this dense matter. And actually, just as a reminder, this was uh, done at this AD uh, successfully for uh, 20 years ago by the chaos experiment, where by comparing the K plus production in gold and in carbon, one could uh, get some idea about the stiffness of the equation of state, which turns out to be rather soft. And this actually is now also still uh, in debate uh, and uh, uh, one can bring into the connection with these uh, neutron star properties. And what has been recently done in uh, these nature papers is to connect the heavy iron data to the, uh, yeah, to the signatures of the gravitational wave. And to, uh, uh, putting both together, I think there is uh, substantial progress in understanding what kind of properties of the neutron stars are actually allowed for. And as a side remark, actually, also from these analyses, uh, one gets also a better constraint on the equation of state here, given as a pressure as a function of the density, so that one can see that precision data, as uh, shown here for this uh, FUPI results in the this ADIN range, are able, one is able to constrain the equation of state. And of course, what is missing is especially this range here up to five, six, uh, or zero. And there's just not enough data. And the old AGS data are clearly not uh, good enough to uh, to answer this question. However, we have the uh, we have the star data, and I think uh, since this is more or less bulk. Uh, the statistics in STAR should certainly allow to extend this, uh, certainly by a factor of two or more. Now, the other thing is, and that is strangeness, and I advocated this already quite a bit, that there is uh, all this physics close to the production threshold. And there's one intriguing uh, observation that was made uh, a couple of years ago by Hades, uh, namely that the Xi uh, minus baryon is overproduced with respect to the statistical hadronization model. And that, of course, is interesting because typically those uh, estimates are within a factor of, of, uh, a factor of two, certainly, or even better. Uh, and uh, this, of course, triggers a speculation that there might be happening something in dense matter that is similar to uh, the K plus production, which was also enlarged in, in dense matter due to the equation of state. And there are predictions uh, by transport model that really link this yield to uh, the degrees of freedom of this matter, like uh, partonic degrees of freedom, which one could call QGB, QGP hints, or even uh, uh, the hadronic matter properties, which would be the equation of state. And of course, to map this out in detail is kind of key to understand uh, what is happening in, under those conditions. Now, uh, CBM as such, and uh, this is around since quite a while, is set up to really measure all of these uh, hyperon decays with good precision. And, uh, I, I, okay, I don't want to go into uh, too much of a detail here. All of this is uh, modeled since uh, uh, quite some years. One has to say CBM started in 2005 as well. So we have a history that is more than 20 years by now. Uh, <clears throat> No, it started in 23, sorry, to make the <laughs> this counting right. Uh, and uh, what one can see actually with such a forward spectrometer at 10 GeV, one is clearly able to cover uh, the relevant phase space around mid rapidity uh, and even uh, somewhat closer with the techniques that we have developed in 
fitting and uh, reconstructing those particles. So the device, the tracker plus the PID is really capable of uh, yeah, an analyzing and reconstructing all this and to reconstruct it even at, a, at this 100 kilohertz that <coughs> I was advocating as an initial step. Uh, one gets very substantial count rates if one runs the experiment uh, for a week. Uh, so there would be more than a million or, two, or close to two million of these omega minuses being produced at 10 GeV uh, with a, even with this rate. And uh, that should really allow for some precision studies along the line uh, that the, to allow for um, yeah, uh, meaningful comparisons to the model predictions. This is not all. Uh, I think uh, bulk yields uh, will not tell the full story. There is no uh, yeah, uh, smoking gun in any of these heavy iron experiments. The, the next thing is, of course, one has to go into the next dimension, which is uh, flow. And as we have seen, the flow observables are helpful to um, pin down the equation of state. And what is shown here by simulations of, uh, of the CBM device is uh, that actually, despite the fact that we have a highly distorting dipole field, uh, we are able to really reconstruct uh, proton flow uh, quantitatively uh, with all the techniques that have been developed in the recent years, namely to <clears throat> equalize out all the uh, distortions and uh, that are coming from the fact that everything goes more in uh, the bending plane. And <clears throat> so this is uh, very con uh, convincing that actually uh, we have with using the PID capabilities of the experiment, which is depicted here on the top rows in these 2D histograms, that we are capable of really reconstructing the primary uh, reaction plane and uh, quantitatively so that one can really derive uh, the Fourier coefficients. Of course, <clears throat> this is the, one of the prerequisites, but now let's come more to the observables that are kind of the burning uh, questions at CBM, ah, quatsch, at, not the CBM, at WIC, <laughs> at STAR. And certainly one of this is to, what is the capabilities to really reconstruct something like uh, this critical behavior in terms of the uh, higher moments of the uh, proton distributions. Now at these low energies, there's no antiprotons anymore. So the only thing that matters is uh, antiprotons. And of course, everybody is aware of this uh, kind of predicted shape, this non-monoticity of uh, this uh, kappa times sigma square observable, which is uh, linked to the susceptibilities. And by that, I think it, one can uh, hope to compare it more directly uh, to uh, QCD or lattice calculations. And uh, so recently, <clears throat> there was already some measurement at STAR at uh, square root S3. Uh, <clears throat> and things uh, look a little weird, I think, I would say, uh, how since uh, the sign changes and all of a sudden, uh, this looks really like hadronic matter here. So the, uh, the URQM deep uh, extrapolations or uh, the uh, hadron gas that tends to go into this direction, although it hasn't been really completed all the way down. But it's clearly interesting to see how to bring this up to what has been measured at square root S7.7 .7 and uh, whether there is any further signs of this uh, non-monoticity. And clearly, one needs uh, resolution here and has to work on, on these systematic errors uh, that are, are shown here. Right now, the statement is there is already a 3.1 sigma uh, effect in claiming there is uh, non-monoticity, but of course this needs to be extended into this range in order to see where actually a possible peak like this is really located. And CBM actually is pretty well uh, set up to continue those studies, and I think there were, and there is now initiated again some quantitative uh, estimations on how well this might work. But uh, just to show here the acceptance for protons in the CBM experiment at, 10, at uh, 
square root S4.9, this is the highest energy and this is the lowest energy, then one can clearly see that uh, there is, uh, the forward hemisphere is covered by PID acceptance and also the, uh, the centrality is well enough uh, covered that one can really go do a detailed study and given the great capabilities of the experiment, I, I think it is uh, obvious that we will reach uh, the statistical uh, errors that are necessary to uh, for this for smaller errors. Whether we reach the systematic one, this is still under work, but I think we are optimistic that uh, this might work. Now, uh, this uh, um, kind of acceptance range looks already pretty good. However, I think there's attempts in, oops, sorry, in CBM also to extend it further. And that is to also instrument uh, the experiment in a way that we really go down to essentially zero PT at mid rapidity for proton and also for pion uh, observables. And this gives rise actually to access into this, what is called the mode regime in these heavy ion uh, reaction, that that is the region that is close to the critical point where uh, the uh, these uh, these conditions are such that uh, there there might be uh, enhancements in this low energy range from long term uh, long range correlations, and I think uh, we convinced ourselves by upgrading one of our subsystems, the the TRD for with tracking capability actually that we have access to this uh, zero PT re regime. And this might be very interesting on the long run in order to pin down further properties of QCD close to the critical point. The other thing that is, of course, uh, getting more and more attention recently in STAR, and uh, by that, of course, since we are in it also, it uh, transpires to CBM, is kind of the spin, global spin polarization or alignment or vorticity, whatever you, you want to call it. I mean, this is an alignment of these produced particles with respect to the reaction plane. I don't think that it is fully understood by now, but it's anyhow very interesting. And uh, what is shown is these uh, measurements at star here for the spin polarization of uh, the lambda and the what is even more interesting of the phi, which uh, for some strange reasons uh, knows about the presence of the uh, reaction plane. And in the moment, uh, as far as I can see, the only way to explain it is to introduce uh, a nuclear force field, this time with a phi meson, which is a kind of reminiscent of the pion uh, field. Uh, but in this case, for the it is needed for the strangeness and I think this is really interesting because it sh uh, just shows the importance of uh, these nuclear degrees of freedom, meson degrees of freedom. Uh, and I, I think uh, this is really a nice way uh, to approach uh, nuclear physics topics. And of course, in the moment since the phi production yield goes more and more down, errors grow. And I think it's a perfect uh, case to be continued with uh, with CBM. The same uh, statement I think I would make for the, the lambdas, uh, which where the polarization is now studied all the way also down to um, square root S3. And here, uh, uh, the model calculations or the under theoretical understanding now hint to the fact that uh, this might be an observable that is even uh, capable of diagnosing whether there is a first order uh, phase transition because then these curves uh, should look different. If you go here uh, in, in this current uh, uh, Hades uh, letter, uh, everything is still or looks to be compatible with a crossover equation of state. However, errors are clearly such uh, that uh, more detailed studies um, might reveal quite some surprises. and. Now, of course, uh, lambdas and especially also anti-lambdas, which are needed to uh, kind of um, pin down the production mode, really requires lots of statistics. And uh, 10 to the 13 events, even for CBM under the highest rates, 
which one could, should be able to do with, uh, for the lambda reconstruction would require a uh, kind of several weeks of running. So this is not easy, but I think it is really interesting as a future perspective. The other interesting thing that is popping up uh, more and more is uh, uh, yeah, hyper, uh, hypernuclear production. And also their star has made big steps forward in order to map out uh, the production of heavier uh, hypernuclei. I think everybody knows the story about the hypertriton and its lifetime. But right now, I think uh, it is more the question whether one can use hypernuclei as kind of a, a tool to measure uh, the correlation of strangeness with baryon number. So to go not only to measure the production yield, but really uh, take their production probability, their relative production probability as a measure of kind of the production uh, conditions. And uh, there is some indication that the models appear sensitive uh, to this. And I don't want to say more, all of this is still preliminary, but STAR is on the way to uh, make good progress in this direction to establish this as a new observable and uh, of course, what uh, CBM is able to do is to extend uh, these studies into the more exotic regimes. And what uh, is shown here is kind of all the collections or is it kind of predictions in terms of statistical model again, and maybe also of transport model, uh, how these heavier nuclei with what kind of, um, yeah, in the statistical hadronization model, you can calculate everything, whether this is true or not needs to be seen. Uh, but there is a huge range of uh, uh, production uh, probabilities covered by these nuclei. And of course, especially interest is something like, interesting is something like this double lambda helium six, because then the two lambdas would sit in the 1s orbital, both of them. So essentially on top of each other, and that would be the ideal case to really study lambda-lambda interaction, which is key also to understand the neutron stars, because uh, right now, if you plug in uh, strangeness into the equation of state, that thing is kind of weakening this, uh, lowering the co uh, compressibility of the matter so much that there is no heavy neutron stars anymore. So the binding energy and the uh, structure of these objects, I think is really interesting. And up to now, worldwide, there's, I think, only three of these uh, double lambda hypernuclei known. And if we would be able to really uh, construct them with efficiencies as estimated here, uh, with something like 60 per week, I think that we would make big progress in understanding of uh, uh, kind of the strangeness interaction at, uh, yeah, at density, so at close interactions, not just in the, in the freeze out. Yeah, there's other exotics that are on the horizon. I'm not sure whether I, I'm, I think I'm running slowly already uh, late. Uh, so I don't want to speculate to match the, the story of pentaquarks in the strangeness sector is maybe not over yet, but still lacks statistics. Uh, at, at LHC, uh, one has found pentaquarks uh, with, uh, with charm contributions. Uh, but any of this, of course, is also a high rate issue. And there are other exotic car that one can look at, like dibaryons in the uh, in the omega section, so with strangeness, or these uh, very old these old ideas of uh, 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 KN matter or lambda star matter, which was pushed by uh, Toshi Yamazaki, uh, are still being uh, actively uh, pursued in Japan. All of this needs lots, lots of statistics, and I hope uh, you are convinced that with more statistics, one can make progress here. So I should rather not dwell too much on exotics. I think they will come by, by themselves once we have the data, uh, but rather than also tell you that there's a fully uh, independent measure of exploring this dense matter by electromagnetic radiation. This is a penetrating probe and uh, yeah, one, one sees uh, essentially that uh, if one would be able to study this, which is suppressed by kind of the, uh, um, the uh, by alpha, the, uh, the coupling constant uh, quite a bit, uh, but in order to address this, 
high rates of course mandatory and as I said one needs a PID in order to uh, disentangle or to identify these dileptons and this can be done either in the electron or in the muon channel with CBM and just to compare to, to star measurements what we are after is to pin down this region here beyond the phi peak uh, and we will probably not you know, we can see the uh, J psi as well but to really pin down uh, these uh, these yields to a level that one can really use them for quantitative uh, statements. And as it already depicted here by Shin's, uh, it was shown at Shin's presentation in the town hall meeting, uh, that if there is a first order phase transition, then due to the lifetime of the system, of course, one expects an enhanced yield of these uh, dileptons. And this is exactly what we are also after with, with CBM. And as I said, we have two options here. There's one where one tries to address this uh, with the electron hadron setup, which is limited uh, in general and not uh, in only in the initial phase to 100 kilohertz interaction rate. So it is limited in, uh, um, in the rate capability, but it is clearly uh, capable of diagnosing even after uh, maybe three years running this low mass uh, region here, which is uh, sensitive to the first order phase transition just due to lifetime arguments. Now with a muon setup, which intrinsically one can run at much higher uh, intensity, even up to 10 megahertz, but initially our estimates, uh, actually where do these uh, three weeks uh, or these, um, these data come from? This comes from all of our evaluations where we were asked to have conservative estimates uh, of what we can reach within the first three years. And uh, that is why these three years always uh, pop up in my talks here. Uh, but anyway, the uh, signal to background ratios in both channels are very similar. And uh, so one can really go for systematic studies. And what is shown here is our uh, evaluation of the electron system where it clearly states that uh, this low mass enhancement here compared to some models uh, predictions by Rupp and co uh, company uh, is accessible over the full energy range of, uh, of CBM. And I think one could certainly learn uh, how partonic degrees of freedom that is given here by this QGB will disappear and die out and so that one can map out this transitions. But it also st uh, stated that a precision measurement in the in this high range, intermediate range, it's called the intermediate range in between the phi and the j psi, uh, will not have enough statistics for a uh, significant uh, yeah, measurement. In that sense, uh, we are limiting ourselves for the first three years to this low mass region, as was uh, uh, also indicated in this previous plot by Star. Uh, but all, however, our error bars will be such. Uh, that we really should also be able to uh, yeah, pin down tiny deviations with respect to the uh, yeah, uh, crossover um, conditions. And uh, in that sense, statistics helps if one really would cover this range here. Actually, we will cover it only up to uh, about five uh, square root s. But in this range, we are certainly capable of diagnosing something uh, which is deviating from this crossover thing. The ultimate goal, however, is to also pin down the temperature of the system, it, the effective temperature, which is a mixture of the initial, uh, all the cool down phase from initial to, to final. But here, this would be something like a caloric curve, and that would be the goal to really reach uh, sensitivity uh, to any um, kind of non monotonic behaviors in this. Uh, range here that is uh, covered by CBM and that needs some higher statistics and the first three years with the MVD as we currently have it would not be enough to do it and of course this immediately then calls for upgrades and I'll come to this uh, because after three years maybe we find some better technologies uh, to, to really uh, map out this uh, opportunity better and but we have another tool that is able to address this range, and that is the muons. 
And uh, this is even so good that besides the temperature measurement in this intermediate mass range, at the highest energies of, C of fair at least, at least 100, one should be even capable of resolving uh, fine differences beyond the phi. And in this region here, close to the 1.2 GeV invariant mass of the muon pair, one should be able to see something like whether the rho and the A0 are getting <clears throat> degenerate, which is of course a signature of uh, chiral symmetry restoration. To map out this in detail would for the first time really be a quantitative measurement of chiral symmetry restoration in uh, these heavy iron collisions. And uh, so this is, I think it's fairly exciting. And I, I think uh, this uh, we, we sh one should follow up on. So uh, there's more things that one can do uh, in terms of charm, but there's lots of speculation ongoing here what the charm cross-section is close to threshold. Actually, I have to say that <clears throat> in the moment there are discussions ongoing also with part of the Hadron physics community along uh, Panda to really uh, ex uh, explore uh, also PP uh, kind of opportunities in this range because we will be able to reach uh, beyond five in lighter ion systems and in proton-proton uh, we have 29 GeV available. So this uh, kind of threshold range of charm production is clearly something that uh, uh, is also doable and uh, yeah, the, uh, given the facts here that if one has uh, the, TR, the match system, which also needs the TRD for further tracking, uh, there is also some uh, sizable statistics possible uh, with the CBM apparatus. And that of course allows another interesting program for CBM. So now second part of it, what, how I'm doing in time, this is, Oh, almost yeah. an hour. Uh, yeah. There, I have to be short. <laughs> um, sorry for this. Uh, so this was physics, but this is the most important. So the rest is now how how well are we doing in preparing this? And there, I think uh, we have uh, a system uh, set up, which is kind of uh, yeah a slice of the final CBM but it is set up already at the ZIS-18 in, uh, in Darmstadt. And this allows to check whether we are actually capable of digesting all these data and the data acquisition scheme that we have invented, which is without a trigger, everything to being done in software. And uh, now the system comprises everything from our T0 counters over the tracking stations, much the muon chambers, the TRD, transition radiation detectors, uh, the time of flight MRPCs, the rich detectors. And yes, the, the next steps are to include also the forward uh, spectrometer, a uh, spectator detector and the MV MVD that will come within the next year. And uh, since just very briefly, the whole thing is running actually, that is very nice. Uh, and uh, it is running since about, uh, yeah, March last year in its final configuration with all the components uh, that we are planning uh, to implement in uh, or to really manufacture for CBM, including this aggregation device, which is a chip that was made in CERN. And then uh, these CRI boards we got from Brookhaven and the green cube is sitting there at GSI. <laughs> uh, and all of this was actually operated and we could even run it online by selecting or to, by producing uh, event selections where one made use of the timing signals of the various subsystems. So this uh, all kind of uh, worked already and uh, we were capable of also bringing in enough resolution into the system by calibrating our TOF to the speed of light. And uh, finally, uh, managed to run for hours. Uh, this was uh, two runs in the light system at the highest energies and the gold system at somewhat lower energies uh, for, um, yeah, this was five hours and this year was maybe one and, uh, uh, what does it say here, 34 hours. So also stability is there, 
However, the rate uh, we reduced to something like 400 kilohertz because we were not so sure that all our online selection algorithms were tuned up to the task, namely to try to reconstruct lambda baryons, which are at this 18 really rare probes. So we rather decided for going the safe way and reduce the initial rate and dump the raw data to disk so that we have uh, now the chance to really reconstruct them. Uh, the, the way this is done, I don't want to go into details since there is no magnetic field. Everything depends on the resolution of the time of flight system from which one has to determine the momenta. And yeah, I wouldn't talk about it if it wasn't have, wouldn't have been successful. So we were able to derive a signal out of a two hours portion of the run. Uh, we got these very nice uh, lambda peaks here uh, with a probability of uh, 10 to the minus six, which is essentially given by the very limited acceptance uh, of this mini CVM uh, setup. But nevertheless, I think uh, this already proves that all these, uh, these tools and the, uh, the technology that we are developing are really working and uh, that one can really hope to go with this streaming setup of, C of CBM into this rare probe reconstruction business. And uh, in the moment, yes, we are working on resolving the, the details of comparing it to our Monte Carlo, which is still much better because it lacks the knowledge of all the broken channels in the experiment. This is a, one of the next steps to be done. And maybe I now cut it short uh, by just briefly showing you only where we stand in the experimental details of the preparation, uh, which is ongoing. We still have five years to go. And uh, maybe most importantly is I think our uh, tracking uh, business, which still is, uh, which is being redesigned or is recently was redesigned because what we did is uh, since we realized that the MVD in the end might be a very limiting factor uh, because of its uh, intrinsic dead time of five microseconds uh, to allow for upgrades of our uh, tracking stations by uh, kind of uh, redesigning a monolithic uh, setup where we had everything uh, yeah, in one box, which was essentially uh, not changeable into a, uh, into a two stage scenario where the first part and the, the first three stations and the latter five stations are kind of separated so that we first of all have a chance to bring the target closer uh, to, the, uh, to the, the tracking system by removing this. The other thing is one can replace this STS through the front part by future technologies, a higher uh, intensity or higher granularity uh, kind of pixel detectors. I don't know whether I said that these STS things are uh, double-sided strip detectors, uh, which have a very nice resolution, but uh, in the end, uh, they also have the problem of fakes and uh, ghosts. And with a pixel detector that would be largely removed. And if we would be able to get in a pixel detector here with high rate capability, I think that would be the next generation even of CBM. It could help quite a bit, for example, also for this intermediate mass range measurements of um, um, in the dielectron uh, sector. So the other thing that is ongoing is I, I think we are close to production for the rich, also the much was operated successfully also in mini CBM and the transition radiation. I think I didn't say it, but uh, the lambda reconstruction already relied on having space points connected from the, the TRD. So also this is, is working. It still needs uh, upgrades in the readout ASICs, uh, which is expected uh, to happen this year. So all of these components, I think, are pretty well uh, on, uh, on track. Uh, time of flight systems, I, uh, you can ask questions, but this is used in uh, ETOF and uh, we are now upgrading it to, for the highest possible rates, which is also a challenge, but it's, uh, it's done by sealing these things and increasing the gas flow. And what is new is that we have to replace the PSD with the FSD and people at STAR will recognize this picture, which is kind of a, 
just the, uh, the EPD, uh, the event plane detector, and we will adopt probably quite some of the technology in order to equip the forward detector uh, for CBM as well. So let me uh, spend the last minute or two minutes on the future of FAIR and CBM in general. Uh, as I said already, uh, there, it was a, uh, a re scientific re-evaluation done in 2022. And this was driven by two things, namely that the cost of the facility increased substantially. And in addition, some of the components that were in-kind contributions from our Russian collaborators uh, were not uh, available anymore due to the sanctions that uh, are put up by the European uh, Union uh, with respect to Russia. <coughs> now, the recommendation of this evaluation was to downscope the project with a cost cap. Uh, and actually, this money uh, that was uh, suggested was given uh, uh, by the German ministry uh, already. And but what, however, what was suggested is to build instead of this full facility something that was called uh, FS plus, which is everything that is labeled here up to the yellow level, namely. So it would uh, be the beam line servicing the super FRS, this fragment separator, which is just this machine. Then as a next step, the this 100 machine with a beam extracted again into the super FRS. And uh, the plus sign then means that the beam is also given to CBM. Now, uh, strangely enough, in the last uh, council session, uh, what was agreed upon or planned for is just FS. So that would be everything only for the super FRS. So the, for the rare isotope facility. And uh, this beam line was just not in the budget anymore. Now, at, it was uh, realized that this would be a substantial cut of the overall scientific value of the facility. So that's what, why it was said that there are exceptions possible. And one of the exceptions was the uh, CBM uh, dipole magnet and the CBM program. And the decision to which extent this will be included now in the full realization of the project will be done in two months from now in July 2023. But uh, Overall, it looks very promising. So I received a letter from management that CBM is clearly among the, uh, the goals of uh, the facility. And so I think we should still uh, be optimistic that the program starts with actual beams in 28, 29. And of course, this also um, benefited quite a bit from some white papers that, were, that are available on the web. You can look up uh, this later, and many of you are uh, connected to this. So this, I think, is absolutely necessary in order to demonstrate the scientific value of the CBM program. And I think everybody who is on those uh, author lists uh, for the effort and also for the uh, support that we get. Yeah, and with this, I think the only thing left uh, for me to do is thank my collaborators. I think the community, despite the loss that we had in the Eastern Europe, uh, in the Russian part, uh, we are still, uh, I think, substantial uh, people, a uh, number of people that can carry out that program. Of course, we would benefit even more if some more groups would join and uh, keep the program active and alive. And yeah, with that, let me conclude. Uh, I think there is really unique opportunities at uh, CBM and at FAIR. We might have the chance to really find the critical endpoint there, and if not the critical endpoint, because it is hard to probably find in these uh, short-lived uh, dynamic situations. But I think the better chance is really to find the first order phase transition that is beyond it. But this is a matter of uh, personal assessment. Uh, and I, I think we can have a really a sizable discovery potential, even uh, if we start with rather low rates and then finally mm -hmm before one finally gets to the full uh, potential. And uh, all of this, I think, clearly speaks in favor of continuing and really pushing for this effort. And yeah, I can only ask uh, or say that we are open for new contributions, new members. And yeah, things will get much more clear uh, if we get a 
positive uh, council decision uh, in July of this year. With this, I thank you for your attention and I hope there are still some people awake. Yes, thank you for this comprehensive uh, overview of the program. So thank you very much. So now we can uh, have a few questions or comments. Please just go ahead. Yeah, Spencer, you want to say something? Um, are we muted? Can you hear me? Yes. Um, yeah, so one of the big things the Russians was supposed to bring were dipole magnets or SS100. Um, what's the plan to replace those? Yeah, so uh, this is still an ongoing negotiation. I think Gina is still part of FAIR. And uh, in that sense, uh, the question whether those dipole magnets, which were supposed to be delivered as an in-kind contribution for Gina, is uh, still pending. Um, however, I think also as a part of the uh, reorientation, I think there's a plan B being worked on, namely to reproduce these, um, not reproduce, to produce uh, those magnets in industry in Germany. And uh, these, um, these plans are being worked out right now. And actually this is what is behind the um, the estimate of 2029, which this is already plan B, namely that one would have to uh, produce those magnets in Western companies. So that is actively being pursued. Uh, unfortunately, I don't really know when this final decision was made. It was also announced for uh, July because there was a, a council meeting just recently in, in April and there, I think there was not a final decision made, but uh, I also would be hoping that uh, these negotiations with Russia uh, don't uh, push the project um, yeah, uh, further back in time uh, due to ongoing uh, negotiations. But politically, I think there is signs that uh, the decision will be now really uh, finalized. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Ashi, go ahead, please. Yeah, no, but thanks. Uh, I have a question on the mentioned the, the dilepton program. Uh, I mean, the day one is planned uh, only in a limit by 100 kilohertz. Is, is that only limited by the MVD speed or any? All other detectors also have limitations. No, I, I think this is really only the MVD. All the other detectors are uh, designed to. Where's my. Don't hear it. We have it here. Did I mention? No, this is here. Um, I think uh, what we also see right now, the what is still needed for uh, covering the full invariant mass range is the rich mostly for the uh, low mass uh, region and then the trd is kicking in here mostly for this intermediate mass regions but both of them are uh, designed for high rate and actually we saw all the trds are operated in uh, mini cbm already and uh, we were capable of uh, uh, checking that they are uh, operational at these uh, fluxes, part, uh, charged particle flux uh, that we anticipate for uh, yeah, 10 megahertz. So this is all there. And actually that's where, where it counts, right? The rich is mostly uh, down here, but it actually is also capable of digesting uh, the rates, but it doesn't see all the high rates because it sits kind of backward in the acceptance. Yeah, so there, wait a second. Maybe I did not spend too much time on it. Where's my setup picture here? Uh, so the the rich uh, uh, sensors are sitting here close to the, the magnet and there, there's a mirror uh, that reflects back the Cherenkov lights into this direction. So they don't see the full particle flux. Whereas the TRD is right away in the middle of the, uh, the overall mainstream and uh, they really have to be capable of seeing all the particles and they're also used in order 
for example, to identify um, high charged particles like alphas or uh, z equals two, three, uh, which is depending on the energy loss measurement in the TRD for identification. Uh, because uh, the time of flight really is only time of flight and there's no additional PID signature there. But yes, the, the, this is just the MVD and the MVD, as I said, uh, is a MAPS detector, uh, which uh, a frame readout and, and this takes a while. And uh, I think the modern developments also for Ali 3 and so uh, simply aim at uh, higher speed and uh, I think uh, within the time frame of another five, six years, I think uh, there is certainly hope that one can uh, enhance these weight capabilities. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Nothing, so then thank you very much again, Norbert. So that's the end of the seminar, thank you. Thank you. I'll stop <clears throat> the recording. So, you know. Thank you, Robert. <laughs> Thanks. Have a nice, yeah. <laughs> Have a nice day or a nice evening. 2 a.m. now, almost. Yeah. <laughs>